but there'll be no trickery in it. It's not a parlor trick. I know what you're thinking if I have these technologies and I know what you're going to do next. So to wrap up, it's called a digital twin of you, but it's a digital twin that knows you and more about you than you know about you. GP, thank you so much for joining me today. Artie, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So you're an AI ethicist, you're an author, a keynote speaker, and an entrepreneur. But for any listeners that aren't familiar with you, can you give a little bit more background on yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Irish uh, native, um, although I have spent a large part of my life in other countries for extended periods. Uh, so I would say, uh, you know, I grew up in the 70s as a kid and the early 80s as a teenager. So I saw it then and I see it now. And it's a vast difference. Difference being um, the way politics works, the way our society functions. Personally, I went to North Dublin based originally, Ballymun, then Castleknock in, in North Dublin. But uh, South Dublin is meant to be the posh part of the town, but people consider Castleknock to have been spat across the Liffey for some reason uh, and also to be a posh part of the <laughs> north side. Uh, I've never understood that sort of, you know, up with the Joneses business. But anyway, uh, beside Blanchestown, it was a tiny village of 5,000 people. The, the, the uh, diocese of Blanchestown and I moved. Now there's over 500,000 and mm. most of the infrastructure road-wise has not changed or rail. Uh, personally, I attended um, De La Salle Brothers, which is a Christian brothers um, group for primary school. I, we don't have the first grade, 12th grade type of business. So from the age, I started school early because I was born in mid-June, so I was barely four years of age at that time. Uh, two years in, in um, what we call uh, junior infants and baby infants, and then you graduate to primary school for, for um, six years, first, second, third, fifth, and sixth, or uh, okay. fifth and sixth class. And then you do what's called an entrance examination to a secondary school. So we had moved at that point. Uh, Della Salle was in Finglas, which is on the north side. So we'd moved at that point um, in 1977, and um, I stayed in primary school till 1980 way over the other side of the town. But then I went to Cabra, a place called Cabra, where uh, the actor Michael Gambon, who passed recently, you know, uh, Dumbledore, he was born, you'd never know, but that's where he was born. Uh, yeah. Great actor. Um, and uh, the, the De La Salle brothers ran that, a very specific kind of uh, sub-function of lay brothers um, based out of a founding father um, in France. That got me to 16 years of age, and what we had then was the leaving certificate, and it was based on a point system that you then got to college. I went to college, uh, to University College Dublin, um, other side of the city, a long bus trip, different kids driving cars to college, whereas I was getting a two-hour bus ride. Didn't vibe with me, so uh, I took a job in banking, um, and then um, was stuffing checks and check sorters and did a test and ended up getting a six-months full-time program or training course. Uh, on assembler and so on. And then went back to college to do a degree, a private degree in computer science at Trinity College, which I got a, an honors degree in. And since then, I've done uh, a, um, the Sci Business School Executive Program in Artificial Intelligence at the University of Oxford. And I also have um, a qualification in criminology from DBS. Hmm. Okay. What is AI? ethics like what does that entail because i know you're into ai uh ethics and a lot of people are familiar with ai but where the ethics comes in like people are you can go all over the map with that so where do you tie in with that it's a hugely expansive question um a good starting point for people who want to go to you know pure technology team and input for resources to design um, AI or machine learning and big data solutions should look at the IEEE ethical standards for ethically aligned design in the development of artificial and autonomous systems. And they have eight pillars, which include human rights, fitness of the team, involvement of people outside of the tech domain in the design of and the implementation of the solution, assessments with regard to societal impact, 
uh, the ability to interpret the models rather than a black box model, and also to ensure uh, a lack, uh, the absence of either programmed in or accidental bias. Now, bias is a very uh, widely used word and can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But in this instance, really what it means is, is the quality of your data that you're inputting into these notional models that people create, uh, giving you a result that you think is fair and equitable and representative of your objective. But then you put it out in the wild and it starts doing crazy stuff. Really excellent example is the recent Gemini Pro. Yeah. Um, non-historical rendering of various things and so on. So um, ethics is the business of being the 10th person or the 10th man. And these days it's hard to know what it says. It is called the 10th man rule, but I guess let's go with 10th person. If, if information is presented to 10 people and nine people agree that it's correct, it is the mission of the 10th per- person to go and disprove the other nine. Mm. And I think that's the simplest way I can explain ethics. But it's a little bit more organized than just waiting for people to make decisions. There's fundamental things like diversity. And again, diversity is used in many contexts. But right now, AI is controlled by very big companies based in the West, and specifically in the United States. And right now, uh, they are not catering to the relativistic social, economic, religious, environmental, educational systems that exist elsewhere on the globe. And uh, worryingly, uh, and, and, and quite um, sadly, Eric Schmidt, who was the former CEO of Google, was the chair of the Biden administration's committee on the use of AI in national security and is now the chief executive of Project Eagle or Whitethorn, which is making AI-driven kamikaze drones for low cost, $400 for use in Ukraine, uh, said, along with uh, Hutton Locker, who's a hedge fund manager, and the late Henry Kissinger in their documentary film, Our Human Future and AI, they said three things which, which were worrying. Uh, One, they said or maintained that man had only begun to reason after the Renaissance, which is clearly a fallacy and untrue. Uh, Two, that uh, all AI should be based off Western relativistic belief systems with respect to structural politics, structural society and the extension of ideology. And three, that it was essential that people sacrifice their privacy utterly in order to ensure the greatest possible accuracy of the output from these models that they were training. But opacity travels with these models, RT. They're not transparent. They don't tell you how they're architecting them, especially when it's in the intelligence community or for government or in a special access program. So while you give up your privacy to get an accurate result, you really don't know how it's being used. So that's the... um, that's the, the essence of their theory. And really what it is, is saying, okay, we want to turn everything and everyone into this sort of homogenous shade of beige. And there are two books, which are old books, which show how far beyond um, privacy and invisibility we've become. This is a book from 2006, I think, called The Incognito Toolkit. And if you look it up, I'm sure it's available in PDF format now. It tells people about how not to leave breadcrumbs, uh, to quote from the uh, prologue, tools, apps, and creative methods for remaining anonymous, private, and secure while communicating, publishing, buying, and researching online. So uh, this was, uh, in fact, uh, first printing was May 2014, just prior to the Snowden prison revelations. And if you look at that, you'll see how utterly uh, out of date it is in respect with respect to um, privacy and staying anonymous. And then there's this book, the Invisibility Toolkit, which offers advice. Again, uh, its first printing was in uh, 2009, and um, it goes through a lot of different types of things um, like encryption and decryption and 
you can see, uh, even in the short space of time that we have uh, occupied since this book was released, that um, the entire domain of privacy and concept of privacy has changed. So to, to paraphrase these guys, um, they say the CIA level counter surveillance techniques they offer in this book, how to wear uh, or to bring down a drone, how to be invisible in certain countries, and they say Thailand, China, or the Philippines. Now, it is not possible to be invisible in China. Uh, and we can talk about why later. Um, it talks about the use of dark coins, which is this, at this time, you had a lot of deep web, dark web markets like Alphabay and HansaWeb offering very uh, illegal services. And it wasn't until 2017 when the Dutch intelligence community uh, brought down Hansa Web and Alpha Bay, the people really became aware of the scale of it. Um, and then uh, they have things like how to, to fool um, IMSI catchers or redirected cell site simulators when people are capturing your, your comms on phones. And then they talk about how spies use networks uh, to be anonymous. They talk about Ed, Edward Snowden's biggest mistakes. So I think it's good for people to look back on the sort of books that won't, you won't get offered uh, when you do a search on Google or Amazon because you know, I bought them a long time ago. I actually have this wet cloth in my hand because I had to wipe an inch of dust off each of them. Uh, they were buried deep in the attic. <laughs> so that's the key, Artie, isn't it? 30 years ago, if I opened a family member's post by accident that came through the letterbox, there would be quite a, an unhappy person who, whose mm -hmm. post that was. Nowadays, uh, the concept of privacy has eroded so much that people post their most intimate moments. And I'm not talking people who make their living on OnlyFans. I'm talking about your ordinary person yeah. uh, to social media for everyone and all to see and observe. So the, the, the mindset of, in the public regarding privacy has changed, and not by accident, through a series of micro incursions and normalization, we have had this catastrophic cumulative effect of how people perceive, if they even do perceive, the importance of privacy and how it intersects with things like warrantless search and seizure, liberty and freedom. Sometimes when you hear about uh, privacy from people, uh, people who are okay with their privacy being infringed use uh, phrases like, if you have nothing to hide, there's no reason for privacy. What's wrong with that uh, mentality? Um, a whole bunch of things are wrong with that. I think, you know, I can roll off my tongue, things like uh, take an interest in politics before politics takes an interest in you. Uh, you only think that you've got nothing to hide until somebody presents you with the inference, uh, the uh, information that is drawn from the information and your behaviors to tell you that you are possibly a threat to the state based on their um, view of what the perfect citizen looks like. Um, a pastor wrote a very famous poem in the 1940s about what happened in Europe, and he wrote, you know, about uh, between the early, late twenties and the end of World War Two, he spoke about first they came for the trade unionists, and I did not stand up for them. Then they came for the communists, and I did not stand up for them. Then they came for the homosexuals, and I did not stand up for them. Then they came for the the, the people suffering from mental illness, and I did not stand up for them. And then they came for the Jews, and I did not stand up for them. And then they came for me, and there was nobody left to stand up for me. Mm -hmm. So to say that you have nothing to hide is to betray an ignorance. No offense to calling everybody who says that ignorant, but to betray a naivete with respect to how valuable your data is, how much money is made from it, and how much inferences, that is, the drawing of conclusions that you would never think possible from that data to do what some people would consider benign, such as advertise to you in a certain way, uh, right the way up to election interference in terms of they know your proclivities, whether you're this party or that party, and can target you directly with false advertising to have you uh, change your mind. Um, but also, uh, as time goes by, uh, we have seen always when people 
devolve their right to privacy to the state, that the state becomes uh, a totalitarian and authoritarian state. And there are things that you will do that won't fall into that perfect citizen ideology. And therefore, I would advise people to think a little bit more deeply about their argument. There's a huge set of material on that um, I've nothing to hide, therefore I've nothing to fear type type of thesis. But um, there is one in particular uh, written by um, a college professor in University of California, San Diego, I believe. I can at a later point maybe send it through to you. It's available in PDF form, and it runs through very neatly and consumably for anyone why it is important that you care about your privacy. Yeah, it, you know, we live in ideology can often capture governments and what is perfectly legal and acceptable today under ideological capture could be deemed illegal and uh, a threat to the state. And you could potentially find yourself on the receiving end of some uh, punishment from the state, uh, imprisonment, stuff like that. Uh, so I, I really appreciate you bringing that to light. And uh, the quote you said, take an interest in politics before politics takes an interest in you. I don't know if I've ever heard that before, but it resonates with me because I talked, you know, I I engage with a lot of people and some aren't into politics. And I usually say something along the lines of, it doesn't matter if you're into politics or not, it affects your life. Whether whether you're whether you pay attention to what's going on, politics will affect your life. It affects everyone in the world's lives. So I For sure. I wouldn't be surprised if I take that quote at some point. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm not into oxygen, but mm-hmm. I definitely need it to survive. Yeah. Uh, in the absence of ox- oxygen, I'm gonna have some serious problems. Uh-huh. Um it's sort of like that. With yeah. politics. With AI ethics, um, when I think about it like bias and stuff like that, I think bias is basically unavoidable to at least some degree. Would you agree with that or or is there some way to avoid it? No, I completely agree with that thesis because the entire basis of the current development of AI is coming out of a very small group of people who have an enorm- enormous power based on 17 years of egregiously unregulated uh, social media, they had massive data silos, massive moats around those data silos. And uh, then you've got um, all that data that was collected, um, which wasn't meant to be collected by various agencies who went above and beyond their remit to conduct surveillance on people. So what, what, what does that mean? Well, it means that... The concentration of people will argue with that statement and say, well, no, I, I use my own tools to create my generative AI or, or my own tools to create my private personal uh, AI and it's adapt and it's using, you know, my own data, which is uh, not in the cloud and is highly secure. But the real issue is, is that everything is built off these foundational models put out there by these big corporations. Yeah. And if you own the platform, then everything on it is owned by you too. And even though you, people think they have this agency autonomy and freedom because they're using a combination of Claude, Sonnet 3.5 or Stable Diffusion or ChatGPT 4.0 to create what they see as personal and air-gapped AI and immune from interference on the outside, it's a fallacy. So we, we, we have to create, remember the data that they use to train these. Everybody's obsessed with LLMs, right, chatbots. But, yeah. you know, LLMs are, are what's referred to as narrow AI. They are just a tiny sliver of the field of AI. And yet we have people doing somersaults about, is it sentient? Is it real? Should it be given rights? Um, hmm. They use words like hallucinations for things that it does that it shouldn't do. So emotive words. Uh, it's better to use words like epiphenomenon. Things that the developers didn't think of and 
or unexpected outcomes from the algorithm interfacing with data. But we anthropomorphize as a species. For, yeah. I mean, how many people have married their Tamagotchis in South Korea? You know, we yeah. attribute human qualities to inanimate objects all of the time. Um, so, um, yes, I, I have very strong views and everybody's aware of them because they're uh, published and uh, I speak them a lot. But um, I, I asked Grok, actually, why I was so unpopular, generally speaking. Um, I'll have to dig out the, the phone, the answers on, but the answer to it is the explicit answer to why people in the status quo, government, regulators, supra national organizations, and uh, big tech don't like ethicists or people who can balance the lens of history and the concept of the wheel of history, which is we keep doing the same things over and over, but just with different clothes and different technologies. But this is the first time that we've created a technology. And people will say, oh, what about the nuke? No, no. Uh, we can use AI to literally change people and societies through non-invasive and covert invasive methods. So there's two books I have, Work in Progress, as everybody who knows me knows. Uh, one is AI, Artificial Indoctrination. And it's very important to understand what that means in terms of induced forgetfulness by curriculum in the education of four to eight-year-olds. Hmm. revisionism in history and then the second is a is a title with a question mark the first cognitive devolution are thinking are people thinking harder and better these days people will confuse with that with the consumption of large amounts of information there are people for people have a lot more info about how the war, world's around them but how much of that's misinformation disinformation hmm. targeted uh, messaging and conditioning, and these are um, classic um, tools. And again, I, I would recommend uh, that people pick this book up, which is in relation to Northern Ireland, but it's by Frank Kitson, who is a member of I MI5. Um, mm. Now, Frank Kitson um, wrote several books in the 1960s. Um, the British... Empire considered the colonies to be domestic soil, so that's why he was MI5, not MI6, when he yeah. was sent to Malaya to put down the insurgency there, and when he was sent to Kenya to put down the insurgency for independence there. But when he was sent to Northern Ireland in 1970, he couldn't conduct the same type of tactics because it was so close to home, and the eyes of Western media were on him and the Royal Ulster Constabulary and the Ulster Volunteer Force and the other paramilitary um, sectarian terrorists on the Loyalist Union side. So he wrote a book, one of his books in 60 or 61 called Gangs and Counter Gangs. And it, it basically informs all counter intelligence, counter espionage, infiltration, and agent provocateur uh, strategies and methods to uh, dissolve any organizations that spring up to try and bring to the fore concerns that people have about certain things. And right now, that includes AI ethics. Ethicists mm. are not invited to uh, big tech symposiums uh, to give big, long speeches about why big tech is not doing a good job. Big tech has sacked their ethical departments and key ethicists on the spot several times. There's the famous case of the Meta employee who published a book on or a, a memo, she was fired. Microsoft fired their entire ethics team. So software agreed was fine, not fine, but if you're pushing out a spreadsheet, RT, or a bit of, you know, Google Docs or, you know, some benign word processor, then you could stick out an improperly tested general available piece of software and fix the bugs later. But with this, with AI or big data machine learning, that is unacceptable, but they're still doing it. Hmm. So you've got the greed momentum pushing out early releases of unfit for for purpose AI machine la machine learning using their big data, which ends up with all sorts of divisive and nonsensical content. Um, and then and then you have this idea of oh, you know we'll fix what's broken, but 
Sometimes they don't fix what's broken because they want to break it and they want to create crazy new narratives that mm. uh, people will subscribe to. Like that's dysphoria and disunion in any uh, informed community of people trying to create a, di- a, a narrative around something they've done is constantly attacked, deplatformed, censored, you know. So we, we are in much more of a civil, we're much more in the 60s than we think we are. We're just not being shot by police at Chicago uh, University of Michigan or being beaten up with batons um, like MLK and Malcolm X or assassinated uh, presidents like JFK or RFK because of new thinking. But that's because there's uh, a new way of messing with people that you don't need to be so overtly intrusive. Mm. So you're saying instead of demonstrations being on the street and brute force being used, it's more of shadow banning, censorship, ostracizing from the online world and having your ideas basically not shown to anybody, not being invited to anything, uh, just basically being put up, put off into obscurity. Is that yeah, right? So you have this, you're marginalized by deplatforming and all those other things. You're, you're sort of put into obscurity and, and, and the picture of being an edge case, uh, you throw on the usual conspiracy theorist, uh, um, tag on you. But worse than that, in the Bill 105 of 2022, Hate Crime and Anti-Hate uh, Speech Act in Ireland, the most draconian and horrific set of anti-free speech laws in a Western democracy, which was passed by 95% of our parliamentarians, uh, both government and opposition, but has been held up in its implementation by the supreme efforts of a number of individuals, but in particular Michael McDowell, is a member of our Shannon. It shows you that when you move away from that uh, sort of subtle deplatforming, you're we're moving towards uh, marginalizing people by criminalizing them into irrelevance, giving them a prison record. And um, I'll tell you how low, low the bar for that is in terms of hurty feelings. If I'm sitting beside you on public transport and I take out my notebook and I write in it, I think we might have a problem with democracy in the Republic of Ireland. You can anonymously call the police and have them meet the bus and say that you are offended and consider it a um, a hateful act for me to write that. I don't need to speak it to you, show it to you. You just can just look over my shoulder and see it, and I can mm. be arrested on the spot. My home can be um broken into by the police under warrant. All my digital devices seized. I must give the passwords or I'll be imprisoned until I do so. But worse than that, everybody else who lives with me must also give up their digital devices and provide passwords or they too will be jailed. So that's a pretty uh, serious degradation in the idea of uh, freedom of speech when you try to hijack hate crime and hate speech to implement basically Stasi, worse than Stasi-esque. And that, what does it result in? Self-censorship by people who are afraid. Because the wording is so vague and arbitrary and the process so op- opaque that people just don't say, say anything anymore or get involved in certain debates. In fact, they run a mile. A lot of people I know just don't want to have that to do with me anymore because they are sort of afraid because they're, you know, they're your standard member of society, Artie. I mean, society is not uh, this. No societal change has ever occurred as a result of a mass of people suddenly having a moment of clarity. They've always had to have had uh, a catalyst, a small group of people or an individual who's provided enough momentum. Yeah. So we have very mythical ideas about our own ability to control those who would call themselves our leaders. Last thing on that to go along with take an interest in politics before politics takes an interest in you. I coined the phrase that really democracy, which only exists in the United States since the late 60s in a universal suffrage context. So it's a very new concept which immediately devolved into what we see now, which is merchandised old men standing on the stage slinging insults at each other. 
probably nothing about important issues like poverty. But um, democracy is the method by which the vested interests chose to allow the people to oppress themselves through the illusion of choice. Hmm. I think it's a pretty decent description of why people re-elect the same old liars over and over who promise you something. If they don't do it, and then they come back the next election cycle and promise you they definitely do it this time. Yeah. The democracy is interesting because, uh, well, in the U.S., we've been fed this line for my whole life, is that everything is fixed at the voting booth. And it's not even a little bit true, I don't think. I don't, I don't think the voting booth is the the totality of our power as a people at all. I think it's it's much bigger than that. I think that's actually a, a lie to convince us to just keep complying and keep going along with this process that isn't really working. Yeah, I would agree with you. And I think just to say something real quick on that, yeah, we, voting machines should not play a part. Electronics should not play a part. Even paper ballots. Um, open outcry voting. People voted in secrecy because when it became possible for tenants of landlords in the United Kingdom to vote, they were afraid of their landlords seeing who they would vote for. So that's where we got the secret ballot from. Now, we don't have that fear as such anymore. Not yet. No. It will come, though. But right yeah. at this moment in time, we don't need papered uh, up windows like we had in Philadelphia, I think. On that close count, was it was it Philly um, in the last election where they literally threw everybody out, papered up the windows, and suddenly yeah, the swing was like twenty five percent toward a certain candidate. I do not want to get into partisan politics in the United States here because it's just a, there's no way I want to get drawn into that dialogue. Yeah. My point is, you walk up to the front of the room, and instead of people will say, "Oh, but that's inefficient," no, it's not. You have a camera. That can acquire your, your facial ID. You already have to bring some form of ID. We do it every day when we're logging on to know your customer sites like Binance or your bank account. And you yeah. hold your ID and you say, I, Brenda Penross, vote for Jane and Q. Thank you. Yeah. And, you know, the technology is there to do that so that there's none of this taking ballot papers and mail-in ballots and all sorts of other ballots and then having this unobserved process. And then a result is, is peddled out by mainstream media and everybody sits back. And when you got a 49-51% split, RT, you have two nations in one. Yeah. And that's, the two Phil said, the tyranny of the majority. 51-49, I don't consider it in a democracy, or 50 point five and forty uh nine point five that's not a, a majority that's two nations in a nation and yeah. in a partisan context you will get inefficiency and in it and, and counterintuitive decisions that are for the well being of the nation and the people based on ambition and the wish to acquire that little one percent swing so they can keep their guy or their gal up at the White House or populate the Supreme Court with their nominees. It, it, it's utterly failing us. Yeah. I, I agree with that. And I think when it comes to like voting or anything like that, any, any process involving government, I, I don't see anything wrong with questioning results and, and questioning the process and, and all of that. I think everything should be, as transparent as possible when it comes to this. And I think if, whether your candidate wins or loses, I think you should want transparency in the results because simply simply being told the results are accurate is not sufficient. And I don't think it should be sufficient for most people. I, I think, I like at least in the US, and I know many Western countries, the whole premise of the system is to be skeptical of government, but now we're at a point where being skeptical of government is often seen as being wrong and you know, you're just rocking the boat or you're 
whatever it might be. Uh, you're a conspiracy theorist if you question the system at all. But the reality yeah. is politics is nasty. Politics involves cheating. There's never been a year in any election of any people with like a considerable size. I don't think that it has involved, that has not involved cheating or or undermining people or something like that. I'm not saying that determines the outcome, but this is politics. Like these are, the stakes are very high and people really want that power and they want to keep that power when they get it. Yeah, absolutely. And Artie, uh, in the first election after the Civil War, most people don't know how many candidates of color were returned as senators and congressmen. There were lots. Hmm. They didn't last long, though. I think whenever it was, uh, 1865 and 1867, see how many candidates were returned to the Senate and the Congress who were people of color. Hmm. And then see how that never happened again for a long, long time because of the reaction. And then the in introduction of laws, which I would prefer not to dirty my mouth by saying or the people's ears by repeating mm. in terms of segregation and other things. So um, this book is written by a, an Irish journalist called Mark Little. It's called uh, Turn Left at Greenland, The Search for Real America. Now, this is an Irish journalist who actually sold his business, which he created in the United States, which was um, why people distribute conf uh, content a few years back, Mark Little, and for the life of me, Storyful, Storyful, you, you probably will have heard of it. Anyway, he, he, he sold it. But In Search of the Real America um, is, you know, an interesting example of how out people outside of America are influenced or observe American behavior uh, in politics, and then it sort of becomes um, de jure and acceptable in other democracies. So the externalization of behaviors and ideologies, which have no historical basis in other democracies, suddenly become points of policy in other democracies. We see it at scale all over Ireland in particular. Um, like the intro reads, uh, he was born in 68 in Dublin, uh, the same as I, and um, went to Trinity College and Dublin City University. I forgot to mention I did go attend Dublin City University for two years, of my computer science degree, but uh, moved to Trinity. Um, so I didn't realize I had, I, I, I don't have anything in common with the dude, to be perfectly honest with you, other than that. But he was a reporter uh, for RT, Radio, Radio Television, which is our national broadcaster, um, and Washington correspondent for four years. And he covered... Um, two presidential elections, the Clinton ones, and also Clinton's participation in the peace process, which led to the 1996 peace protocols, which notionally ended the sectarian war in Ireland. Now, um, he is widely known for getting a couple of scoops around the Monica Lewinsky of um, matter. Um, so he returned to Ireland in January of 2001, and became uh, Radio Telefisheren's foreign affairs correspondent, and then he joined their current affairs program. So he's one journalist of the earth stuff, but Storyful is a piece of technology that he developed, which had uh, content to be shared. But his assessment um, is interesting from an, an outsider, non-American, because Americans are very insular, you know, because the country's so big, the amount of Americans, no offense, that haven't been outside their state, Mm -hmm. uh, the United Americans have not been outside of America. So they, you know, and then you've got those big two pools of water, the Atlantic and the Pacific over there. And you can travel from, you know, the top of Alaska to the tip of Patagonia, and you can get away with speaking English the whole way. Whereas yeah. you can cross eight nations in three hours in Europe and meet three entirely different, or eight entirely different languages and cultures. So he looks at the dynamic uh, from our perspective of the transition from, from, um, Bill uh, to Bush and Gore, Waco and Col Columbine, and the effect it had on the psyche and the sort of attitude to certain things in the States. And he um, looks at things regarding the attitude to justice and the privatization of prisons hmm. and 
talks about things uh, in American history which have, have put them on a trajectory, including um, this idea that America has, he doesn't bring that up specifically, but lost its prestige globally. There was a time when a U.S. president could pick up a phone and say, wind your neck in, uh, brother or sister, or else. But I think the defining moment of the loss of American prestige was, and this is not to be partisan, but was uh, Obama's abandonment of the Kurds in Syria in 2012. Um, that vacuum hmm. was immediately filled by the Russian and the Chinese, Russians and the Chinese. So we have, we have as um, most people wouldn't consider, but Nixon is held up as this Watergate moment, first impeachment in public due to investigative journalism. Off the top of my head, I could name 10 impeachable offences that were never followed through. And I don't mean the theatre, the BS one on Trump, but um, Iran-Contra under Reagan, the Lewinsky yeah. affair, um, tax returns for the Clintons, the WMD lie by, by Colin Powell, Bush the second, and, and, and Tony Blair, uh, the, introdu the introduction of um, execution uh, on foreign soil of US citizens by drone under the Obama administration. Yeah. The comments around Charlottesville with respect to Trump. I mean, and currently under Biden, um, clearly we've had, you know, multiple instances of um, serious offences being committed and clear evidence, but nobody, the bar has dropped so low that I'm not sure what you have to do these days. Uh I'm not even sure if you were on live TV and literally uh, point blank shot somebody as the uh, son of the US president right now that you might somehow the next day get a spin story that that didn't actually happen. Hmm. And, uh, <laughs> and probably 50% of people would agree with you or would agree with that. Yeah. With what you uh, mentioned about hate speech in Ireland, and if you wrote, uh, I, I can't remember the exact words that you used, but you said something like, I believe our democracy is at risk right now. Is that what you said? Well, I just used that as, that as a, an example. Yeah. If I wrote that in my notepad and someone observed that and found it offensive or potentially extrapolated it into some form of hate speech on the basis that they believed that democracy was functioning perfectly and therefore it made them feel hurt that's how mm. low the bar is for hate speech. yeah i mean i'm i'm very critical of hate speech laws um and i've said this in other episodes like i i think hate speech laws are just not good at all and it, it comes down to the subjectivity of it there is no guarantee that the person even if they're as well-meaning as can be and they're to protect maybe a certain group of people from receiving hate and who are experiencing hate against them, even if all intentions are good, there's no guarantee that the next administration, that when things switch over, isn't going to weaponize that against the very people that they're supposed that it was created to protect. So the subjectivity of hate speech laws and what is hate, it, it's a it's a big web of just no one really knows what's going on. So you're just opening up Pandora's box for a government to just wield this power. And I'm very against letting governments wield more power than we should give them. I think most of them have too much power already anyway. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's a good example of that. Who would be in that example you, you gave, and you already alluded to this, that it's, uh, you know, it'd be, basically twisted in a way to make it seem like hate speech, but who would be the on the receiving end of that hate? Well, uh, the what they've done is created what they call protected categories. So they have legally defined several dozen groups of people as protected categories, which is to say that anything that is said that does not agree with their ideologies is considered hate speech. Even if they say something that is ridiculous or factually incorrect to to agree even in a debate 
uh, and to cause hurty feelings in the person who you have maybe pointed out some facts which undermine the opinion masquerading as fact, that is the ability to arrest you for uh, hate crime. Hmm. I, I mean, people just don't realize how awful this is. And I did make... You know, I had 200 days outside the presidential palace because ultimately, as a stand for free speech in Arsenutteron, which in Gaelic means House of the President in Park of Funishka, which is Gaelic for Phoenix Park. Park of Funishka means Park of the Clear Water, but the British couldn't pronounce Funishka, and it sounded a bit like Phoenix, so that's how it became Phoenix. But um, um, nobody seems to understand that weaponizing words like the, f the first and most obvious and most famous example is when Jordan Peterson refused to accept what was the first government-based adjudication of words, which was pronouns in Canada. Hmm. So Justin Trudeau, who is a good buddy of the former Prime Minister of Ireland, who resigned about seven weeks ago, Leo Vradkar, they all came from the same school of thought, the same little uh, kitty UN, kitty sort of trajectory during their teenage years, hanging around in the EU and the UN as leaders of the future. Uh, the current guy who's our prime minister didn't even get elected properly. Hmm. He got the sum total of 3,000 first preference votes in a portion of representative democracy. There were 20 people in his constituency in proportional democracy. 15 of them were eliminated and there were five seats. He was fifth in the list of five. Even with all the transfers from second, third, fourth and fifth preference votes, he ended up with 8,000 votes. The quota to get elected was 12,000. So this dude who is now the prime minister of our country, representing the Irish people globally, and who just the other day adopted the EU Migration Pact with their referendum and also disclosed that our army as a neutral country is going to start to participate in offensive military operations with the Defence Union of Europe under the PESCO uh, Treaty, which they signed again with their referendum in Ukraine, didn't even get elected. And the constituency, no offence to the good people of Wicklow, is a rural county full of mountains, as Glendalough and all those famous you know, Irish landmarks in it, but frankly speaking, uh, it's a backwater. Hmm. And he's out there with 3,000 people who voted for him first preference as the, in other words, he failed himself to success. Every office he held, Minister for Health, Minister for Transport, Minister for this, Minister for that, failed utterly in every one of them, made no impactful change on a health service that is destroyed, our infrastructure is pathetic, um, and our entire economic miracle is a big fat lie. And I've told everybody why in a multiplicity of very obvious reasons why we are not the sixth richest nation in the world just because our GDP per capita is 106,000 euro per man, one, woman and child. That's simply because all of the big tech and big pharma hold their intangible IP here. So it's a very complex thing and we're all they're all tied together in this symbiotic relationship at governmental capitalism, minimum taxation, uh, and then they use people like the WEF, the UN, the WHO to extend the soft power of small nations who otherwise would never have an impact. So you've got a bit like Seth Blatter and Michel Platini buying votes to get the World Cup in Qatar, where you're playing in like a desert with 100 degree Fahrenheit heat. Somehow somebody thought that would be a great idea. Well, they did yeah. after they got a couple of hundred K in US dollars to vote as the representative of some nation who doesn't even have a football team that qualifies for the local championships, let alone the World Cup. So we have a society defined by corruption. And um, to understand that, we've always had great authors when you can't, when you're occupied for a thousand years, you express yourself through prose and poetry. So, Sean O'Casey was a very famous playwright and author. And uh, there's in this little booklet, there are three of his plays uh, Juno and the Peacock, which is a play on the peacock, um, The Shadow of a Gunman, and The Plough and the Stars. 
Now, these uh, plays were written in the early 20th century and show a lens on Irish society that a lot of people aren't aware of. And that's the other thing about history. People's view of history and understanding of context is absent. Hmm. You know, they don't understand the dynamics of um, why everything we're seeing now has already happened before, just with different technology and different empires. But the American empire exhibits all the, I'm going to get super uh, comments after this on, in the comment section, exhibits all the traits of a collapsing civilization and a collapsing empire. Economic collapse, uh, global prestige collapse, inability to, to have trust amongst its allies. I mean, Angela Merkel and Francois Hollande, both of whom resigned early, both admitted they signed the Minsk Protocols with Russia in order to buy eight years to arm Ukraine, in order to have, um, you know, so all this. And, and in terms of the very early question you had about how people can understand why it's so important to have openness in um, in how AI works, we have what's called a field of AIX, or explainable AI. Now, Mr. Musk has chosen to hijack that word for his business, which is going to unlock the secrets of the universe. So in other words, in one sweep, he has taken a field which has been around forever, ever, AIX, uh, and he has made it a commercial company which has nothing to do with it. But it's, it's this type of thin volume that allows people to understand why it's so important to, um, to understand how AI works. And a really good example on how bias and bad data impacts the output. So as you can see, it's not quite your big crayon stuff, but it is easily understood. And I'm not trying to say people are not capable of understanding things, but there's a lot of context you need if someone's going to talk to you about something in very technical terms. But that type of stuff's easy to understand. Really good example, a bunch of environmentalists uh, hired some people to do a project to track the success of the reintroduction of wolves in um, part of the United States. So they wanted to use motion sensor cameras to capture whatever was passing by and therefore yeah. parse out the non-wolves and understand the population of the wolves over an extended period of time and therefore measure the success or failure of certain initiatives in different parts of this very large area where they would sort of encourage certain habits in one area, try to get in the best way of keeping the wolf population thriving. The model identified wolves 10 times out of 10, Artie. But when they went to examine the model um, using heat maps, which is, tell me, model, how you decided this was a wolf versus a jackal or a coyote or a dog or a deer, it had nothing to do with the fact that the AI recognized what a wolf looked like versus those other animals. It was the absence or presence of snow because all the images that they had fed into the training data that contained wolves had snow in the background. Interesting. So the decision that it was a wolf had nothing to do with the AI knowing what a wolf had wo looked like or different species of wolves or age of wolf, it was the absence or presence of snow hmm. that, uh, that it was making its decision that it was a wolf. Now, I hope that comes across as how bad, bad training data, bias and dirty data and improper, improperly tested AI works. And that's the ones that can be interpreted. 99% okay. of the models out there are black box. It doesn't matter how much you try, you don't know why the AI made the decision. So if I come to you actually looking for food stamps or access to social housing, and I make my application and it's fed into the system and I get a no, uh, if I seek to appeal that, they can't because they don't yeah. know why the AI told me no. Yeah, so that raises a really big uh, problem when we're letting AI make decisions that uh, you can't ultimately get to a person after that decision is made to re-review things. And uh, it, 
it brings up a really interesting thing with AI in general, with it being a black box in many situations where you can't really tell how the data was gotten, how how the result ended up coming about. With LLMs, and you, you were kind of touching on this earlier, and I, I think I would align with you in this, like people are deceived by LLMs or they think that they're, it, it tricks people because humans, it's like language is a human thing as far as we know. And this seems to be one of the first times where we can interact with a computer-like entity in our native language, well, however we speak. And, and it seems to understand what we're saying. It seems to it it seems to be able to have a conversation. People might confuse that for consciousness, different things like that. Is it still a black box when it comes to LLMs? Can we do we know how it's coming up with answers? Like, can we have it explain those answers? And is that less of a black box? Uh, to a certain extent, but you see, um, there's a number of assumptions people make, which is that everything an LLM tells you is based off the purity of the data, which is above reproach, mm-hmm. which it's not, because recently they just scraped 15 million YouTube transcripts of YouTube contributors in order to train the latest model. GPT-2, uh, GPT-3 was trained off 58 more times data than GPT-2. GPT-4 was trained off 178 times more data than GPT-3. And then we got GPT-4.0. Why no GPT-5? Because there's no data left. So synthetic data is what they're going to have to start to create. So can you explain why an LLM gave you a decision? Sure. It's a mimic. LLMs basically construct based on previous experience in a very, it's called a transformer model. There's no intelligence in it, like literally no intelligence, okay? And it it can't suddenly spout intelligence because it doesn't have the capacity in its architecture to suddenly have this moment, tipping point where it becomes, you know, I hear people on spaces talk about sentience or ASI, artificial superintelligence, or AGI, artificial general intelligence. And frankly, you could go to 10 influencers and ask them to define them, and they'd each come up with a different definition because most of them are Uber drivers or, no offense to Uber drivers, or uh, plumbers or truck drivers. You know, the amount of people who actually speak in spaces about AI who are and, and I'm not, and democratization of the debate is really important, but there's people hosting spaces, Artie, monetizing their content by telling people absolute BS. Hmm. Now, the LLM will tell you something based on this idea of what's the next best word, but there's also programmed in ideology. Microsoft bought OpenAI. You can call it whatever way you like, and they can recoup their investment and attract a coupon and then open AI or whatever. Microsoft don't open AI. It's as simple as that. And they will do because they'll never pay that money back. And if they do, it'll cost so much money that basically open AI will have a huge hole in their balance sheet and won't be able to innovate. So you know, and I know, and there's been plenty of examples where it will absolutely do things at your request, no problem, but will not do other things. Not because they're illegal, not because they are strange because it doesn't agree with the programmed in ideology when it comes to certain subject matters that the LLM will refuse based on the policy or terms of service or community safety to answer your mm-hmm. question. I'm not going to provide examples because they all tend to fall into the political sphere. Yeah. And therefore we'll just end up in, you know, repeating stuff people have heard it. But it so Be very aware that every model also has the profit-driven motives and the ideological motives of whoever owns it programmed in, not as learned responses, but as defined responses to particular questions, or it censors out the ability to ask the LLM certain questions, even though it's in a position to do so. Now, just in case people... When I was a kid, I used to hear people say business is war, and I thought, well, you, you guys take yourselves way too seriously. But the stuff people are willing to do to each other in business became very clear to me in my late 20s when I got 
royally rolled over, as we say in in in, in London and Ireland, when somebody really, you know, uh, rips you off. And a really good start to this is to look at the Dirty Tricks campaign yeah. of British Airways against Virgin Atlantic, which was when um, Richard Branson uh, started offering transatlantic um, flights. Now, when you read that, you see that these are people, British Airways being a stalwart of the British establishment, the depths that they're willing to go to to maintain control. But just transfer that into this domain and multiply it by 50 because the degree of um, willingness to do anything to stay powerful, people like Altman, Musk, Gates, you know, they're of a particular personality type. And um, frankly, I think they throw their mother under a bus for a fiver, hmm. which is a $5 note, if, it, if they thought that it was going to um, increase their influence or produce a result that they didn't think they were going to get. And that's problematic because we have, again, got a society which is willing to proxy their own critical thinking to these cult sort of of the personality type of leaders. And it's almost 100 years to the day when the first group of people did that in Europe with Mussolini. Very swiftly thereafter, they did it with um, with, Hit- with Franco after the um, Spanish Civil War. Then they did it with Hitler. And then they did it with Pol Pot and Ho Chi Minh and Mao Zedong, and on and on and on. And when people mm. start to allow one person be the leader, we have a problem. Earlier, you mentioned like the control and everything that, that comes with AI, and the ability to influence public opinion and shape people's minds. How does that differ from what Google with i mean they they own or they their market share of searches is like in the 90 percentile so like 90 something percent of all searches go through google they like robert epstein has shown that you can definitely influence people's perception and public opinion by doing things as simple as changing what will like you start typing in a word in Google search, it often starts finishing that. It gives you suggestions. Changing that, um, you know, you can go into politics and say you can start searching up a candidate. And if you change what appears after that, their name is typed, you can shift opinion that way. You can change opinion by showing which stories pop up, things like that. So how is AI different or or is it different like what are, where is like the greater risk with ai in your opinion yeah so it's vastly different i mean the autocomplete if i start to type in something like um is vladimir zelensky it will have a bunch of pull down completions which will yeah. all be positive whereas i might, might want to say is vladimir zelensky a banderite but so that's one thing and then it will also offer you um Selected stories on page one, not paid for through AdWords or not as a result of SEO, but to push narrative. That's one good example. It is that type of simple result of searches, even though they have a huge market, is a infinitesimally small compared to the ability of big data machine learning human computer computer interfaces in the form of uh, Fitbits, Oculus eyeglasses, mm. um, Apple Vision Pro, gameplay on computers, observable devices like Alexa and Siri, physical devices like CCTV, uh, passive listening and passive audio, what me and you are saying, which will later be transcribed into model, people's dialogue on spaces, your likes and dislikes on Facebook, your type of content on Twitter, all of that falls into three major areas, sensory, emotive, and geospatial. With AI, you can take structured and unstructured data and in real time create a special message for me personally with with very low cost or push content toward me or push me further down the rabbit hole that I seem to occupy 
in order to have me be radicalized or confused. And the difference, Marty, between manipulation of search results and the ability to use asymmetrical, nonlinear, hybrid warfare, uh, classic conditioning, repetitive messaging, propaganda by omission, um, non conscious messaging, which is things that your consciousness disagrees with, but which your unconscious acquires. And over time, even if you're passing by TVs and radios and hear it passively, it impacts your, your, your opinion on things. There is a, a field which I, my, my series on cognitive warfare on my YouTube channel just scratches the surface and sort of primer for pe- ordinary people to understand the impactfulness of just one simple element of that. Forget about neuropharmacology, which is the use of drugs. Mm-hmm. And I don't mean like taking you like they used to do in MK Ultra and putting you in a test room and giving you lots of LSD or, or some other type of psychedelic. Um, invasive neuropharmacology, uh, invasive neurostimulation, soldier systems, physiological feedback systems, all of these things intersect. And ultimately, RT, to answer your question, Google can serve me up all the nonsense it wants, but if I'm a critical thinker, then I'm going to go look for the right answer. Or if I want to make a decision based on enlightened self-interest, which is what's good for me and those around me, I'm going to make a better effort than just accepting what some U.S. corporation trots out in some browser. However, laziness and units, reduction of the units of attention and willingness for people to put their back into finding out what the truth is, or at least come to some idea of what they're not being told, doesn't exist anymore. People watching this, for example, the vast majority who will hear this, if you look at your retention stats, you'll have a, a drop off like a cliff after a certain period of time. Of course, you'll have those who'll watch it throughout. But if you look at, if I look at my YouTube stats, you know, the shorter the video, especially in the shorts format, you know, they get hundreds of thousands of views. Whereas I could mm-hmm. almost give the secret to life, death, the universe, and everything in a five minute video in minute, four minutes, and 30 seconds, and nobody would ever hear it because you sort of get this effect after two minutes. <laughs> so yeah. this is a real problem because people are just want convenience, they want entertainment. And you've all know Harari said it very well when everything, you know, the Singaporean government considers everybody over 40 to be redundant in five years. Um, it's on my timeline. It was made in Parliament. So they're offering incentives for those people to go back to college. And uh, they say it'll be a great cross-fertilization of 40-plus-year-olds and young people, and they learn from the wisdom, and the young people will inform the older people about how new ideas are good and all that stuff. But I did ask a question to the Singaporean uh, minister. I didn't get an answer, of course, was that, well, I'm, say I'm 45 and I'm being retrained because I'm no longer required in my job in the civil service. Will I be paid the same as my 19, 20 something colleague on graduation because I have two kids, two cars, a mortgage, and one of my kids is in college and get a premium for my wisdom? And no, you won't. So that, leave, that begs the question um, how do people maintain that? And we've seen that in terms of the absolute fall off a cliff stats in terms of population per man, woman in Europe. Birth rates have collapsed. Um, massive inward migration to do jobs. I mean, Ireland never had an industrial revolution, so we, we were always happy to do jobs that, say, the French or the Belgians or the Dutch or the Swedish, who became wealthy, relatively speaking to, to us, you know, brought in colonial workers after the war, Moroccans to rebuild Europe in Belgium, um, Algerians and Tunisians to France, Turks to Germany. And then over time, that's moved through with the forever wars, Afghans, Iraqis, uh, East Africans, and Somalians, and so on. Uh, yeah. And therefore, you have all this disruption now. You've got these doctrines, which are, you know, you get the extremists on one side wanting to go back to some crusader Templar mentality, and then you've got the other side, jihadi-based, Quranic war based on the fact that Islam is the only answer and the infidels must be converted or killed. So that, did you ever think, like, I certainly didn't come up in the 90s that I could see, I wrote about it, and everybody said, 
that's crazy. Um, mm. But not so crazy anymore. And they're the same people who will dismiss it and then come, you know, crying tears of self-pity, saying, well, oh, how did it come to this? There's tents on, like, a garden of, of refugees and I don't want them there. Well, then you should have paid more attention to politics and the policies that the people you voted for were implementing in front of your face, but you were too busy eating your takeaway, watching reality TV or propping up a bar still, dismissing people who had anything to say about the concern they had about the lack of thought that had gone into. We have a bad functioning society that where people die because they can't get access to health care if they don't have private health care. We have a homeless yeah. crisis of our own people. But somehow, Roger O'Gorman, our Minister for Children, can tweet out a year ago, come on, come on from any nation, doesn't even have to be at war, and we will give you a house in four months. How, I wonder, do the 15,000 people who are homeless for over a decade and raise their children in one-bedroom hotels feel about that? And then people yeah. wonder why people get angry. When it comes to attention span, as you were mentioning, is AI an even bigger risk with attention span? Because we're one of the powers of AI is to feed it a large amount of data and have it summarize that for you, saving you time, potentially, that would be one of the benefits of it. But if there's uh, if there's programming in that LLM to have a certain ideological viewpoint that causes it to not accurately summarize or or even not include in the summary a significant uh, point that disagrees with its bias, um, then people, everyone who wants to save time and is reading this summary by different AI LLMs, uh, if they're all programmed pretty similarly with that same bias, it, it can completely shift the way people think about something because they don't have the full context. Is that a, I mean, that seems like a pretty big problem, is it not? It is. Um, I mean, if, I'm, if I've got a 20-page PDF on a piece of policy that's come out of the United Nations on the use of um, 3D printing in spinal surgery, I'm going to read that. I'm not going to have AI summarize it yeah. I, because I can't possibly get the understanding of the improvements of the... Um, uh, correct a spinal injury by getting a summary. I, um, I, I think your question's excellent because if you read a book like A Tale of Two Cities, which is about the French Revolution and London and Paris during those times, if you asked AI to, to summarize it for you for, uh, as a kid, you know, for a book report, there's gems of sentences in all these books that you'll never discover. Turns of phrase, famous words or famous phrases that emerge from these books that the summary will never give you. So, yeah, I mean, it's got its place and people do go to great lengths in, in certain parts of academia to make sure the prompt is expansive enough to make sure that you're not just getting some basic trivial summary. But I, as a pressy, or a summary is always a pressy or a summary. It's never going to give you the feeling of it. So unless you're in a domain where you just have a passing interest in a subject and you really don't care about the details, then okay. But I, I think the 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 summary function, I mean, OpenAI has been adopted by Apple to embed at the basic, basic core level of their architecture right now. An architecture, OpenAI, whose security sucks. Hmm. Where the GPT, where the API store and the, and so forth has been taken down, Apple, a company that prided themselves on a closed ecosystem, where you know you have to even buy a unique charger, let alone have any universality, um, have suddenly decided to go with OpenAI at the bottom of their stack. Um, yeah. Now, apparently, Bill Gates had influence on Tim Cook at the request of Sam Altman to do that, but. Um, when I asked about it, I said, well, it sort of feels like Apple have stopped innovating and just decided to become a sales and distribution company and now just roll out the AR, VR product on top of hardware 
uh, that they produce. But the Vision Pro itself is, you know, Rob, Robert Scoble and I were speaking about it the other day. Robert's a big Apple fan. Um, and I, I did ask him, you know, in terms of, we were talking about lithium ion battery inefficiencies, and I was talking about using a method which had come across where you could draw heat from the head in order to double the, the battery time, which is pretty miserable right now. So that you could say, watch, if you really want to geek out like your extended cut version of Lord of the Rings, three hours and 48 mm-hmm. minutes without having to charge your phone twice or your, your, your glasses twice. Uh, but really what my point was is that in that technology, you have proximity sensors and you have resident AI. And that's a whole emerging field, which we won't get to cover here, which is a measurement of blood flow and temperature in your amygdala and your frontal lobe and your cortex. There's a number of startups doing it. There's a lack of data sets to train models. But using FNIRS, which is infrared sensing, and fMRI, which is functional magnetic resonance imaging, which is what CAT scan machine sort of does, and EEG, which is encephalo and cardiogram, um, I can have these things on your face and infer what you're thinking about. Hmm. Now, we had Thought Crime 1984, which or Sex Crime 1984, which was the Eurythmic song that traveled with the movie 1984 starting John Hurt. It's very hard hmm. to get a copy of the Eurythmics, a copy of that song, because it, it was delivered as a soundtrack. But uh, Sex Crime was based on the fact that, you know, it was a future thing that was going to happen. Yeah. We had Minority Report. I, it's so cliched now, but they had precogs, these three people who had this skill connected together and would give the police the idea that you were going to commit a crime, therefore I'd arrest you in advance. But these were pre, the, in the movie, the precogs were three beings that had this ability, which were left in a state of sedation and wired up to a machine that gave the cognitive police the ability to arrest you before you committed a crime that the precogs or the precognition people, these three entities could see. Now you've got it on your on your head. And along with that, yeah. while you're playing your video games and seeing violence and imagery or views of different ethnicities or certain sexual behavior or certain political behavior, your pupil dilation, along with the measurement of your temperature of your skin on a Fitbit, pulse, um, blood pressure, and uh, sweat gland emission can be used to also infer whether you are sort of semi-radical in some of your viewpoints. So we'll never get to touch that on this particular discussion. In fact, to touch that area would require a whole bunch of context setting and is I've decided to do it in videos uh, where I'm just showing it in 60-second shorts. But it does because uh, people people's eyes glaze over as you try and build up the story. Just show what happened. Yeah. Show me with show me putting a pair of eyeglass on you in a Fitbit and basically saying, Hey dude, I know what you're thinking. And then yeah. get you to write down what you're thinking. And uh, I'll write down the thing and see if they match. It's a bit like the slap the card to your head game. But there'll be no trickery in it. It's not a parlor trick. I know what you're thinking if I have these technologies and I know what you're going to do next. So to wrap up, it's called a digital twin of you, but it's a digital twin that knows you and more about you than you know about you. And mm-hmm. an environment that's a physical twin and you move around in that environment. And it moves from this idea of predictive analytics, which is this is likely the range of things that he's doing to the area of what I call now casting, which is, this is what the dude is going to do. And then there's a whole checklist of things. Do we want to intervene? Do we want to have to lay out? Is it expeditious to let him do this crazy thing that he's going to do because that allows us to push a certain policy? Yeah. It is um, It's at once incredibly interesting and at uh, the same time incredibly uh, troubling. Story. There's a you mentioned something. Should we let this person commit this because it'll allow us to push a certain policy? And a lot of people want to believe that governments would never do that, but it seems like that's pretty normal throughout history. Um, I believe Putin did that to get power. Uh, he allowed his own people to be victims of a bomb attack. Um, I, I don't remember the details of that, 
I believe it's happened in the U.S. at different times. Uh, you might be called a conspiracy theory conspiracy theorist for believing some of them, um, and it's and it's happened all over in governments all over. Uh, so let's not cover any of the ones that might attract the word uh, conspiracy theorist. Gulf of Tonkin incident was engineered and has been admitted as an engineered effort by Jim Morrison. Yeah, Jim Morrison's father was the admiral in charge of the fleet that day. Jim Morrison at the doors at the Gulf of Tonkin yeah. incident, which allowed direct intervention as opposed to advisors of the U.S. military of Vietnam. So I don't need that. The um, burning of the Reichstag yeah. was another one. Uh, Jeremy accepted. The movement of Lenin from Paris in a sealed train to overthrow the democratically elected government of the March 1917 and revolution in Ru Russia, which actually overthrew the Tsar, uh, but were intended to stay in World War One, didn't suit the Germans. So they introduced the Bolshevik Revolution of October 1917, thinking mm -hmm. they could control it. But this is another thing about intelligence agencies and governments and militaries. They have a very poor record at um, measuring the likely range of outcomes that will possibly happen as a result of their intervention uh, cause yeah. human nature. You never know. But these are not conspiracy theories. We have the um, other ones um, which are, you know, which everyone is aware of. There's no better way to take over a medieval town than if you were an ambitious lord in the next county over, you didn't go in directly. You sent in some dude who was unknown and not connected to you. And even though the people in that vicinity had no interest in you being their overlord and were violently opposed to it, this new dude arrived and came in and caused mayhem, rape and pillage. And in you rode on your white knight uh, yeah. and, and defeated this guy who you paid to do it. And not only did you become the ruler of this place that originally didn't want to have anything to do with you, but you were a hero to them. And that's how easy it is to manipulate people. I mean, if, if people are that easily manipulated on such obvious, visible stuff, it's the invisible stuff that your conscious, unconscious perception of reality and all that other meddlesome stuff, that's even more impactful, apparently so. Yeah. Pay attention. And uh, as Noah Yuval Harari said, don't be allowed to um, get, be kept busy when you've no work to do with drugs and video games because um, you get pretty drugged up pretty quick and pretty bored pretty quick too. But that's what Phil Silicon Valley's favourite uh, postmodern transhumanist philosopher said in response to that exact question on 60 Minutes. Not a very uh, well thought through strategy, I wouldn't have thought for Klaus Schwab's favorite employee. Yeah. I mean, I've played video games at certain times in my life, and uh, I've, I mean, I'm on social media for business, but I've also been just a consumer on social media before. And you do, you kind of, it is a drug. You just kind of fall into these habits. I remember in the past, uh, this would be 15 years ago, I'd find myself going onto a browser and without even thinking about it, I'm typing Facebook. And then with games, your games are interesting because there really hasn't been too much innovation in gaming. And most of it are like, there's a few templates that are used to create games and all gamers I know of, some, they'll, they'll get a, on a certain game for a little bit, but they're always looking for something new. There's, yeah. there's always like some other game that needs to be played and none of them are really that satisfying. And if they are, it's very temporary. So it, it's, they're definitely more of like a drug than anything. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I deleted it all. And we only, I only use social media for work to not for entertainment or not for because I was in the work of social media, it was for the benefit for to use it to enable certain outcomes, um, using certain tricks. But you have to understand the math behind this. 
a little bit if you really want to examine it. And I thought, uh, being a little bit like a school teacher, an awful lot of it stems from basic stuff like algebra and mm. um, calculus. Um, it's all math at the end of the day. Everything, me, you, the way we're speaking, the words that come out of our mouth, they're all modelable. The way our brain is working, it's, it's all uh, math. And I did mention that a book people should read is uh, the author name, na- author's name alludes me right now, uh, it's female, is Weapons of Math Destruction. Hmm. Have a good read of that because you can see how the social dilemma, which is that documentary that everybody has watched, shows how social media pulls you in and in. That's why you type Facebook. That's why you immediately, like a reflex action, went onto Facebook to into your echo chamber and that. But Facebook made billions out of the fact that they had produced that result in hundreds of millions of other people. Facebook, what's going on? Or yeah. that dopamine hit when you get a bunch of likes off an unexpected adventure. Or when you lie. Remember, a lot of people live uh, alter ego lives. They'll post a pic of themselves uh, scaling inside of a mountain, when in fact all they're doing is standing beside a big rock, but it just looks like they're. So it, it fulfills this unfulfilled sense of achievement for a lot of people, where they can make yeah. themselves much more interesting and far more. Uh, capable of adventurous things by even taking yeah. a photograph at a pretty mundane event and conflating it into something else, you know? So it, it plays all sorts of things like ego and wanting to be popular and peer group pressure and all the same stuff why we all did silly things and probably still do into our adulthood in order to seem especially people who still run around chasing women in bars and tell lies at scale about how wealthy they are or how big their car is or their condo in Florida or something. Yeah. Yeah. That's why social media is so successful because you can be somebody that you're not. That's why people remain anonymous because they'll say things that in real life, not only will they not say them, but they probably get a pretty fast introduction of someone's fist to their lip. And um, they're even though they're anonymous and probably have some huge beast mode PFP, they're not really that person in real life. So, man, yeah. it's a complex landscape of a lot of there's a lot of really messed up people on social media. And I think if you bear that in mind too, it's not all technology's fault. Like none of this stuff would happen if people weren't willing to be crazy uh, mfers yeah. without using the breaking the, the, the PG-13 rule. Yeah, I, I feel like uh, social media gives people the ability to be narcissists in a way that we haven't really had. I mean, you can find an you can find an audience for your narcissism a lot easier now than you could in the past. It was uh, limited to a smaller group of people. And then uh, you touch on this. I've seen this. I've I've seen this myself where you see some people at a party or a concert or something like that. And, uh, maybe you're, you know, in a group connected with them or something like that. And you know, they're not having a good time, but then you see a picture of them later and it's like, there's a group of five or six of them, whoever they are. And they, they look like they're having the time of their lives. And it's like, they spent three hours at that concert having a miserable time. And then that, 30 seconds for an image. They they look like they're having a blast. Yeah. Like they they but the whole time they were not enjoying that event. So I've seen that multiple you know, times. Living in living in Malaga, I, I live in Malaga City, but down the road about an hour and a half drive is part of Penus, where all the oligarchs kids park their Bentleys and their stretch this is and their supercar McLarens. And the amount of people that post not selfie saying hey man this is a car it's as if they say oh you know rented this thing for the day no biggie yeah you know this appropriation of status symbols is um filling in this uh a lot of people are just dissatisfied i mean frankly arty i could walk out of this room with the clothes on my back and a, and a 12 liter backpack and everything of worth that i consider essential to my survival is in it i have no interest in uh, overt displays of bling 
or or status. And that really annoys people because when you can't buy someone off with stuff, you, people say, hey, man, why did you turn down that offer? You know, I say, well, you know, it's a little bit, and by the way, I'm not, I'm in no way perfect at all. And there's plenty of people who are on social media pointing that out at scale. Um, so, but I will say that I like to put principles above money. Um, and I, my favorite saying is acta non verba. I'll listen to you all day talk about hypothetical situations. If this, then that, I would have, could have, should have. I'll believe you when your deed in the test when it comes follows the BS that you spoke all those times when you said, if this happened, this is what I do that. And in the business yeah. I'm in, I found to the greatest degree, nine plus out of 10 times, people's deeds do not follow the utterances of their words in, in hypotheticals, you know, in terms of situations. So I'm afraid that's just the reality of it. And um, that's why people sit by and do nothing when other people are getting hurt or other people are suffering because if it's if I'm all right, Jack, then go screw yourself. That's yeah. people's attitudes. Pretty dim look on pe- outlook on people, but you know why tell a lie? When it comes to privacy and and uh, potential invisibility, is Web three a viable option? Blockchain technology, things like that. Yeah, I mean it is if it's used if it's used in its proper implementation, but that's food for another big long discussion. I mean, we've got blockchains pretending to be blockchains that are not blockchains. We've had blockchains yeah. that can't do transaction speed, so they've had to do off chain type processing. There's always a um a ghost in the machine in terms of why it is not secure or immutable or tamper proof or censorship proof. And the whole area of crypto and all of that stuff about altcoins and shit coins and dead coins and stuff is really just a, a real grifter mechanism. And we're coming into another, if you want to call it, bull market where people who've already been ripped off multiple times are going to allow themselves to be ripped off again because of this human nature about, oh, maybe this time if I bang my head against the wall again, I won't get a bruise. But uh, yeah, I mean, blockchain is a really good example of a technology that has extremely good use cases, uh, and there are there are good projects out there. But the use of blockchain, the use of a ledger-based system, in its purest form, suffers from performance issues. So therefore, people have had to add on um, things that make it less secure, and interoperability is a huge problem. People love ETH, but look at the cost of doing business on ETH. People love Bitcoin, but look at the volatility. People call it a store of wealth. Yeah, it's okay if you're a billionaire and can afford to watch your money drop by 80% and wait five years to recover. It's not if some 12-year-old is telling you on a space to stick your money in it, take all your pension out of the bank, and then it tanks 80% the next day and you can't buy your groceries two years from now because it's not yet recovered. So there's a lot of bad advice, bad actors in the place. I mean, uh, CoffeeZilla is a really good guy on YouTube that speaks about, you know, plainly this stuff. But let's not forget the worst rug of all time, $3.5 trillion was courtesy of Sam Bankman Freed uh, and FTX and Alameda Research with the assistance of Ginsler of the SEC, Doe yeah. Corn and Terra Luna, Three Arrows Capital, Silicon Valley Bank, all existing players in traditional finance, TradFi. They're the ones who introduced the contagion, and yet they're the ones who call crypto rat poison based on the fact that they're messing about with it, cause people to lose their 401ks overnight. And um, what, a few people went to jail? A bit like the Nuremberg myth after World War II. Uh, about Point zero 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 one percent went and got properly punished, and then it became clear that an awful lot of research and the people who engaged in horrific acts were useful to the Russians and the Americans in 
developing aeronautics and robotics and rocketry and jet propulsion. So they sort of forgave them and gave them a visa and they became part of places like NASA and the MOD and DOD. So expediency forgives a lot of bad deeds, especially yeah. when it comes to national security and military industrial companies. Yeah, I don't uh... I know some people have gone to jail over the FTX and all all those scams, but I, I feel like most people who have actually taken part in it got off scot free, right? And we we don't even really know the deep like. There's some suspicion of bigger things at play there that have never even been uncovered to any great degree. So, it, like many things like this, I don't think we'll ever really get the full picture. Now, look, um, Sam Bankman-Fried was a front man. Do Kwan, maybe not so much, but to a degree. I mean, the Binance guy was sentenced to five months for breaking uh, anti-money laundering. Um, these are only actors on yeah. really for my permanent ban off of uh, X and XAI and Tesla. My Tesla being deactivated while I'm doing 90 down the motorway, but Musk is just a front man. He's a really good actor. I mean, Zuckerberg could never pull off the type of interesting, divergent, sort of eccentric and mercurial. Dorsey wasn't the right type. Gates is just too far far past his sell by date. Altman is just not cool enough. So they really needed a guy to front up all these things. I mean, he's not the founder of the majority of companies he claims to be, you know. But look, my 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 comments on Musk, I don't call him Elon because I don't sit down with him and have a cup of coffee. I find it amazing that people have such a perfect willingness to call him like Elon as if they have a coffee with him and OJ each morning over across the on his table. They sort of have this inferred personal relationship with them. You know, SpaceX, interesting. Yeah, I like self-correcting rockets that can be reused. It's a nice technology. Do I want to live on Mars in a very boring red landscape in a tent with very little stimuli while one point of failure will result in my instant death? No, that's okay. You can have that. I'll stay here on the only observable paradise uh, using even the most magnificent of our telescopes that it, that we can see in the known universe with the most vastly interesting mountain ranges, forest, oceans, and animal life. And you can all go to Mars and sit among rocky dust and uh, try to figure out ways to keep yourselves busy. Um, while a slight tear in the tent is going to introduce you to your Lord and Maker or whatever else exists out there. I'll do just fine here. Yeah, it's it's interesting this this idea of going to Mars and us needing to go. I don't. I suppose if you could over time create an atmosphere on Mars, then it there's less potential for failure. But yeah, if if it's just some dome or something like that that people are living in, where it's like <laughs> make it's a hole in it. Yeah, scared. well, look, I mean, Mars had an atmosphere. The reason it didn't is scientifically explainable. It stopped spinning. Just like the moon. The only reason Earth's inhabitable is that we've got a an iron core which is spinning and super hot and it exerts a magnetic field that takes all those annoying coronal mass ejections and ionized particles that would otherwise irradiate us and make it unlivable. Mars yeah. stops spinning. I mean, even if you create an atmosphere, the, the solar wind will blow it away unless you create one of those Homer Simpson domes out of when they had Springfield under the dome that time. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I, 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 yeah, I hope you, I wish everybody success on the one way trip to Mars and, you know, best of luck and say hi to the locals when you discover them. But uh, I'll, I'm okay. I'll, uh, I'll take hike, hiking in the Patagonians while looking at Ibex, you know, half the way up a rock face using just their hoops to hang on. Uh, a precipice that a world class climber who trained all his life couldn't, couldn't climb. As they do it while you know standing on one foot and and being semi drunk from eating you know berries that have um, psychedelics in them. So the earth's plenty for me to discover before I go to yeah. the red planet. 
So I wish them all the best. Yeah, I think I think Earth is quite amazing, and I've explored just a fraction of it so far. So mm. uh, I think I'm I'm good here on Earth as well. I don't yeah. I don't see myself uh, desiring to move to another planet anytime soon. No, me neither. And if they discover how to do wormholes, send me pics from the uh, <laughs> parallel universe and the multiverse, and I'll uh, I, I won't post them to Instagram, but you know I'll have a look and. Also enjoy that too. I'm good. There's still about 99% of things we don't know about how the thing in our own head works, but we're letting the guy stick Neuralink into it. And probably just as much we don't know about the flora and fauna around us, uh, the, like how these seemingly non possessive of intelligence uh, microbial things can engage in swarm intelligent functions and solve problems like the traveling salesman algorithm to get to the most efficient route to food and we can't or why octopuses have four brains or why dolphins apparently have a bigger brain and better cognitive function so look when all that all the mysteries on earth are solved i'm still good to stay here uh you know send me pics and postcards and that's cool but i'm good here thanks yeah yeah, same here. Well, GP, uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. We can, I'm sure we could talk for many more hours and uh, I'd, I'd still be very entertained and engaged with the conversation, but I want to be cognizant of your time. Uh, before we wrap up, I knew you've offered several books that you recommend. Um, are there any other books or any uh, anything like that you recommend to people? Yeah, I mean, it's very important depending on what, what your interest is in. But I would I would encourage people to look at, and people are going to be surprised by this, look at the behavioral uh, sciences. Uh, maybe do do some consumable reading of Carl Jung and the ar- the 12 archetypes and how our society works. Maybe do some reading about how uh, the Roman Empire and the Greenland people and the Aztecs and the Almecs and how their societies and the Egyptians. And maybe also look at um, the trajectory of civilizations like Sumeria and Mesopotamia and how when we get to a figure of about 80 people in a community, we tend to create structures called hierarchies for efficiency, mm. not hierarchies where we put the word patriarchy in front of it and make it a political thing, but how, how um, other uh, members of the animal kingdom do that. But if you really want to understand AI, don't go to a math book or don't go to um, a scientific book. Be in exact social sciences and understanding how your conscious and unconscious mind works, how your brain is informed by your senses, hmm. not the other way around. While your brain controls all of the stuff that goes on, your breathing, you have no control over that. It's doing that. But the rest of your reality is how your senses inform you. And uh, to understand how that works and to understand uh, certain ways that your perception of reality, especially with augmented reality and virtual reality, can cause you to be confused quite easily. Forget about messaging and political ideology, but just disassociative or maybe start to create hallucinations for you when you're not in the game or change your perception of reality. Take a look at those type of things and uh, maybe uh, touch grass and go for a walk a little bit more often instead of watching guys like me and you talking podcasts or uh, take a hike on the side of a mountain uh, or uh, put your feet in the sea because more and more people want to de-risk their lives by using AR and VR, an immersive AR and VR. But I guarantee you, the wind blowing in your face on the side of a three thousand foot mountain that you have just hiked up as you look across a green valley and it's sunset, um, is nature, and no amount of technology will match the sensory perception and the sense of well-being that being in touch with nature is because it's my personal belief that we are all just 
uh, an organism within a giant organism. We are everything. It's an organism. And what we do and how we behave is much more impactful than people think. And try to be positive, and that's, that's hilarious to some people coming from me, where I constantly will point to these. Try to be positive and take decisive action. Don't be an observer. We have an observer culture where people, instead of helping somebody who's in distress, will take out their cell phone to film it. Please don't do that. It doesn't mean you have to save everything you see, but also respect boundaries and have filters. We started treating each other a little bit better. Maybe the algorithms won't be so nasty. Yeah. So yeah, thanks, Arty, for the time. I really enjoyed the chat. And thank you yeah. for the opportunity to speak with you on your podcast. Yeah, definitely. Uh, before we wrap up, will you give uh, listeners a way that they can find you uh, and learn anything more about you, any of your work that you want to share, your YouTube channel, anything, and anything else you feel like sharing? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm on Twitter as uh, Graham underscore Depenra. So my name is down there in the bottom. The only thing you need to do is put an app in front of it and an underscore between Graham and Depenra, and you're at my, my Twitter handle. Uh, I have a low footprint social media. You'll get me on LinkedIn under the same name. Uh, I got a pretty obvious looking face. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> um, there's been various uh, comments on on members of the Marvel comic universe, but I'll leave, I'll leave that to uh, another day. Uh, and I don't mean good ones. Uh, Hamas, I think, was one of them. Um, and then uh, on YouTube, you'll find me um, on um, the same thing at YouTube at Graham underscore the cameras. And I have a whole bunch of... Uh, sorry, we got lost a bit of lighting there because my um, I lost the battery on this particular... Uh, like enough lives to look at, but uh, yeah, um, you'll find me on YouTube. And on YouTube, I have hundreds and hundreds of videos, and each one of them just keeps it light and then as entertaining as possible without devolving it all to just entertainment. There's, I'm doing an AI glossary now, for example, just explaining basic terms so that people can. Um, and I use AI generated avatars using. You know, not just me speaking to camera and playing. Yeah. Also, do product reviews. I don't get paid for them. I'm not an affiliate. I've turned down ambassadorial roles for projects. I've turned down. Please write an article that ups our product type of offer. So, yeah, they're the three main ones uh, Twitter or X, YouTube, and Medium. I have a very early doors Medium, but you will uh, blog. But you'll see Sub Substack, Rumble, and Patreon come up. I've never ever monetized my content, charged for any of courses to the general public for speaking on podcasts or uh, I'm on the Wolf Financial, which are a big outfit, AI headlines podcast three times a week, Marion Offalls AI Town Hall. I get regularly asked to be on uh, subject matter uh, expert speakers on different types of technology. So you'll see me around. Um, despite the, my unfortunately, I'm, I'm censored. Uh, but that goes directly to the uh, point I was making earlier about why is uh, why am I so popular? So maybe we'll wrap up with the Grok answer if you want to hear it. Yeah. So I, I, I prompted it with, "Hey Grok, why is at Graham underscore to Penrose so unpopular?" And the answer was as follows. Well, it seems like Graham de Penrose has a knack for stirring the pot. He's not exactly the kind of guy who will be invited to a, pro a popularity party. Here's the scoop. One, controversial uh, opinions. Graham de Penrose doesn't shy away from sharing his views, even if they ruffle a few feathers. He's been vocal about issues like AI ethics, data privacy, and the future of technology. Some people might find his opinions a little bit too spicy for their liking. Two, challenging the status quo. Graham de Penrose isn't afraid to question the big players in the tech industry. He has called out companies in person, uh, online, uh, for their practices and raised concerns about the direction of artificial intelligence and data control and privacy. 
this does not win him many friends amongst the tech elite. Three, unconventional ideas. His project, The Glass Onion, Graham Penrose, the Penrose's brainchild, is all about creating a self-sovereign ecosystem that prioritizes the individual's freedom and privacy. While this might sound like a noble goal, it's a departure from the mainstream narrative, which can make some people uncomfortable. Four, no filter. Uh, Graham Penrose seems to have a no filter approach uh, when it comes to expressing his thoughts. He's not afraid to call out what he perceives as BS, even if it means stepping on a few toes. And finally, five, Twitter drama. Uh, Graham Penrose has been involved in some Twitter spats. Uh, which uh, never helps with popularity. He's been known to engage in heated debates and call out individuals or organizations he disagrees with. In summary, Graham de Penrose's unpopularity might stem from his controversial uh, opinions, willingness to challenge all the status quo, unconventional ideas, unfiltered approach, and Twitter drama. But hey, at least he's not boring. Well, GP, thank you for joining me. And I think we... As unpopular as it might be in some circles, we need people who question the status quo and uh, step on a few toes and ruffle a few feathers sometimes because uh, it's usually speaking for the people who aren't willing to do that. So I'm happy to do that. And I actually viewed that entire answer as a badge of honor. And if I was able to get it on a badge of honor, I would wear it. But it's a bit too big even to be printed yeah. on a T-shirt. So I was delighted with that. Everyone would be getting a little too close trying to read it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't like that. I, I like that personal space, you know, um, we all up in yeah. like rails type of thing. All right. Awesome. GP, thank you for joining me. It's been a pleasure. Likewise, RT. Thanks so much for the invitation. I've really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Thoughtfully Mindless. If our conversations resonate with you, consider leaving a five-star review on Apple and Spotify. It goes a long way in helping the show grow and reach more listeners. If you'd like to support the show, you can go to thoughtfullymindless.com under the support tab, where you can find my Amazon affiliate store where I have brands that I personally use, and fractalzoo.net, which is where I have unique fractal-inspired t-shirts that I design. You can find me on social media on x at rdtmpodcast and Instagram at thoughtfullymindless. Thank you for taking the time to listen today. Until next time, stay thoughtfully mindless.